because I hate the environment, as we've discussed. I want to poison the dolphins. Hello everybody, Future Simon here. Just before we get into the video today, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by Beard Blaze. You might be thinking, what's this, Simon? Another sponsor with Blaze in their name. What is this witchcraft? Well, I'll tell you, it's not witchcraft, and it's not a coincidence. Beard Blaze is actually something made by me. <laughs> it is a new beard oil. It has my face on it. It is made, well, to say it's made entirely by me, would be a bit of a lie. In fact, that would mostly be a lie. But what happened? Let me, let me tell you this. A few months ago now, I had a Business Blaze video, and I think we were talking about like creators who have like beauty lines. <laughs> and I was sarcastically saying, I should definitely start my own beauty line. That would be amazing, because it is massively, legitimately profitable. Like, the richest YouTubers, it's all like, what do they do? They make color palettes. I didn't even know what a color palette was. And I was making fun of this. And then a Business Blaze legend called Will, he emails me and it's like, Simon, I happen to run a very large company that makes a lot of cosmetic products for a lot of other large companies. Would you be interested in making your own beard oil? And I was like, yeah, Will, I would be. <laughs> I don't know, at first I was like, no, nah, I was kind of joking. This probably isn't going to work. And he was like, dude, let's just give it a try. And so we basically, <laughs> he sent me out a bunch of samples. I actually have like 10 of these. I've got three of them here but there are loads of them. And he sent me out a whole load of them and he was like, just try these in your beard over a few days and see which ones you like. And so I liked a lot of them. Some of them were better than others for me. I don't know about you guys, but like certain beard oils get that. This is very specific. You have to have a beard to understand any of this stuff. But like, I really got along with some of them. Uh, my favorite is actually one we've made called the Basic Blaze. Ba -da 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 -da. And what you do is you just take off the top pipette thing like this. You drop a couple of drops into there, depending on the size of your beard, and you rub and you rub it in, and it kind of brings all those weird stray hairs in. It does all of that good stuff. This one also smells fantastic. What other stuff? I actually wrote myself some talking points because I know otherwise I will just waffle. Yeah, so Will mixed these up in his lab. He sent them all the way over to me in Europe. <laughs> I tried them all out and I was like, let's do these ones. And so he mixed some more up. Basically my whole goal was I've used beard oils for a long time. They're always super expensive. And uh, I was like, we could probably do better than that. <laughs> so we tried one until we got it perfect. Mwah! One that I really liked. And then they're like, well, let's put it in a real size bottle. Because I don't know about you guys, but I've got beard oils before and they come in like these tiny little bottles. And I was like, let's just do a proper size bottle. So there it is. And it's also at a proper price point. And you can actually get half price off right now because we're kind of testing it out and we don't know whether it'll work and we want you guys to try it and hopefully leave us some reviews. <laughs> anyway, that is Beard Blaze. I'm excited to be promoting something that is mine. You can find a link to it below or just go to beardblaze.com. There's no discount code or anything because it's, well, it's mine and Will's. So just click below. There's discounts already applied on the website. Let me know what you think and uh, let's get into the video. Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Business Blaze. I am your boy with the blaze. Uh, you can buy a t-shirt that says that, by the way. It would be a lie because I am the boy and you are not, but you can if you wish to. Uh, again, I don't know why. I'm terrible at business. Perchthemerch.co, there is a link below. This one is even more advertising fails. What happens here, if you're wondering, you might be curious, is that Danny writes me a script. It is right here. I will read it, I'll add some unfunny jokes, and Sam will add some fine memes afterwards. That's what's going on, even more advertising fails. This is like part 19 or whatever, because whenever I'm not feeling very creative, whenever I don't have any good ideas, which honestly is like 99% of the time, I just look at what did well in the past, and I was like, well, let's just do more of that, Danny. Get to work, basement boy. Younger Business Blaze viewers may not remember this, but there used to be a time where people would write letters to each other and send them through the post. Back in the day, the typical postman sack would be positively bulging with contained excitement, warm expressions of encouragement and good wishes. The only, I only ever get letters where it's like, it's a hassle. I've got to hassle about something. It's like, oh, you need to change the amount you pay for your gas. I'd be like, brilliant. Why don't you just change the amount? You're the gas company, what am I gonna do? Not pay? I don't have a f***ing choice, do I? I don't need a letter explaining every little thing I need to do. By the end of the last millennium, everyone's attention turned away from boring old mailboxes that were becoming increasingly littered with advertising junk as we became more thrilled by the voice notifications that informed us that we had a new, a rare new email to read. Oh my God, one of the f***ing banes of my life. And something that I believe, I probably still have a little bit of trauma in me today is thank you letters. I don't know if this is just a Simon family thing. I don't know if this is a British thing or an international thing, but you see it, receive a gift. Like Christmas comes and like your, your, your relatives send you gifts, right? And it's like, oh great, thanks, aunt. You sent me a wooden car. I'm 17. 
Um, and then it's like my parents were always like, you got to write thank you letters. I'll be like, guys, it's 2003. I'm writing letters to people? Why can't I just email them from my email? Hotmail.com. Uh, well, letters, it's, uh, it's appreciated by people. So I'd spend like half a day writing out. I don't want to, I mean, I, I realize I sound like an ingrateful prick, but it's like, it was painful. It was painful. And even today, even today, people will send me a gift and they'll expect like a thank you note. Like just, uh, uh, whether it's an email, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a letter. And honestly, I just thought, don't, don't send me a gift. Send me a card. Like, because I didn't have to reply to a card. You ungrateful bastard. And there was a point, I reckon maybe in my early 20s, where I just stopped sending thank you notes to people. I just, just stopped. And I stopped receiving gifts from large numbers of my relatives. And my only response was f***ing good. And another thing that people, <clears throat> or like my family, would often think that I just got wrong, was that you give someone a gift, right? This is what my family said. You give someone a gift, you give them a card. The card goes along with the gift. New card. What do you think? Pick them up from the printers yesterday. And I'd be like, I'm giving them a gift. Why do I have to give them a card? It made no sense to me. I haven't, if I'm, if I'm giving you a card rather than a gift, it means I like you less than if I gave you a gift. And if I gave you a gift, you're not f***ing getting a card. It means I like you more than all the people got that got cards. What's up with all these rare cards? You're sure about this? <laughs> what the f***? So yeah, no, I don't send cards. I don't send thank you letters. I'll say thank you when you hand me the gift. If you send it to me or I post, just assume that I'm grateful. I'm probably not. It probably got shoved in a drawer in the corner where I'm not going to use it because you don't have the same taste as me. AOL users may remember those voices as well. Here in the UK, we had a posh act. We had posh actress Joanna Lumley informing us politely that you have email. Oh, you've got mail. Sorry, I don't remember that at all. I don't think I had AOL. I had something called CompuServe. Apparently Elwood recorded all of his notifications on a cassette deck. Who the fuck's Elwood? What is going on? Oh, okay, I missed, <laughs> I missed a line. In the US, you were more likely to have the laid back tones. A voice artist, Elwood Edwards, never heard of him. Cheerfully announcing, you've got mail. Oh, okay, so uh, I, I, I can't read. I swear I can't read. Like, okay, so Joanna Lumley says, you have email. Elwood Edwards says, you've got mail. Apparently, I would record all of his notifications at home on a cassette deck. Okay, now we're now we're getting somewhere. Let's just carry on, Simon. Come on, get your shit together. We're like four lines in. Uh, and although he's now semi-retired, you might be able to summon lift off him if you live anywhere near Ohio. He's occasionally been spotted working as an Uber driver and entertaining passengers with some of his finest quotes, such as "Files done" and "Goodbye." Oh, how those rides must fly by. Yeah, they don't. I like with Uber Comfort Yakutin, <laughs> I'd like to be quiet in my cab. <laughs> I never check it because I don't want to be a dick, but uh, and, and often I'm happy to chat. But there is sometimes where it's like, I don't know, you go to the airport, it's five o'clock in the morning. It's just, I just want to listen to some music in silence. <laughs> but as the years rolled on, it feels as if the early enthusiasm for email eventually slipped back snugly into the postman's now slightly withered sack. We no longer get excited about logging into our webmail and wading through dozens of automated marketing emails from companies that once brought, but you bought something from eight years ago. Oh, I've got a bone to pick on this regard. F you, National Geographic, you pieces of sh I didn't sign up to your mailing list. Somehow you added me to that mother or someone else added me just to troll me. <laughs> Which, I mean, if you, you could sign me up, I mean, don't, don't get any ideas. Don't get any ideas. You could sign me up to like Cox Weekly or something where they send you images of Cox. But no, you sign me up for National Geographic, which at first I was like, okay, this could be interesting. Little did I realize it is f***ing impossible to unsubscribe from. I don't know how to report National Geographic to whoever we should report these people to, but f*** you. I don't like you anymore. I'm f***ing f***ing on you in this video. If anyone like f*** you National Geographic, hashtag Twitter war against National Geographic, that's too long. Hashtag, hashtag f you Nat Geo. Woo! Daddy chill. And we now get slightly more intrigued at the sight of an increasingly lesser spotted personal, le lesser spotted personal letter arriving through the post. Back in 2004, a Spanish woman was certainly intrigued when an unusual letter popped through her letterbox. It was pers- what the f are we talking about? Advertising fails. It was personally addressed to her, but the author did not reveal his identity. This letter was composed on pink notepaper, and it appeared to be an invitation to indulge in a little adventure following a recent brief encounter. What is going on? You read, Yesterday we saw each other again. We met on the street and I noticed how you glanced interestedly in my direction. I only need to be with you for a couple of minutes. And even if it doesn't work out, 
I promise you won't forget our little experience together. This reads like something that pops up in my spam email box. This must have confused the female Spanish recipient. She was a disabled 97 year old woman who hadn't left the house in years. But it seems as if her mysterious admirer was casting his net wide anyway. 50,000 other Spanish women received an identical anonymous love letter on the very same day. This is like OG spam or like, uh, is this called catfishing or cat hooking, fish hooking? What the f is that phrase where it's like, or is that, that's for catching, that's what that catch a predator guy does. What's it called where like they trap you in and then they get you to send you money because um, they think, you know, you're in a relationship with them, but there's actually a dude in Nigeria or something. I don't remember, but is this, but before email, right? Or Facebook or however they do it. Who exactly was the author? The recipients would have to wait an agonizing six days for the answer to their burning question. When all they, when they all received a follow-up letter from the same source, who this time he dared to reveal his true identity. And it turns out it wasn't a person at all. It was the new Fiat Cinquecento. Oh God, this is an advertising. Oh yeah, of course, because advertising fails. This is, this is, I don't know. It doesn't feel good, does it? Doesn't feel, doesn't feel right. Uh, yes, the Italian car maker, Fiat, had devised a bizarre marketing campaign with a six day wait for the punchline to launch their new model for the first time in Spain. Yeah, I mean, so they got it wrong because that 97 year old woman is confused about the letter from uh, the, the mysterious admirer. She's also gonna be confused about why Fiat wanted to buy a car. It's like she's 97, she can't f drive. I remember my grandma got too old to drive and she'd drive places and I'd be like, and this happens honestly to all my grandparents. And it's like, you shouldn't be doing this anymore. It doesn't seem safe. You're probably gonna get lost and you don't know where you are. You don't know who you are, but you're still driving. I am nervous about being on the road with you. A spokesman for Fiat claimed that we thought it was a fun campaign aimed at the independent, modern working woman. One of the recipients disagreed and sued them and you can't blame her. Sued them for what? Where is the loss here? Although it's usually easy to spot a marketing campaign from 100 miles away, that initial letter had no indication that it came from Fiat. Instead, it was perceived by some of the recipients to be downright creepy and stalkerish. Some of the recipients even claimed that they've locked themselves in the house until the mystery was resolved, and Fiat also failed to factor in the damage that they could cause, could cause, uh, be causing to perfectly healthy relationships. So some of the recipients' husbands began to question why their wives were receive it, suddenly receiving mysterious love letters in the post. Yeah, that's a good one. Look, although, why are you suing for? You didn't go to work for a few days? I mean, good luck with that. And also, Fiat should be punished in some way, like there should be some fine for breaching some advertising regulations or something, because I'm sure they did. But it's like, don't be suing Fiat. It doesn't, what? Just go, get on with your lives. People who sue people for stupid shit like this, it's just f***ing stop it. Despite the avalanches of complaints and criticism, only one recipient bothered to sue and received the equivalent of just over a thousand dollars for her efforts. You got a grand. Well done. <laughs> the company also received a quite pathetic fine of less than a hundred dollars from the High Court of Zaragoza for distributing the menacing letters. hundred dollars to be at. Uh, why? Why? <laughs> It'd be like someone fighting me a thousandth of a penny. It'd be like, this is just what the effort of paying this is just... Ha, why? Fiat sent out a further 50,000 apology letters which explained how the campaign was meant to have worked. Let's hope those letters, letters, they got those letters right and they ended up scrawling the notes in the blood of slaughtered virgins. <laughs> Holy sh**. Ah, uh, Revenge of the Sponge, Sponge mon Monkeys. What the f*** is this? Over the years, children of all ages have been enchanted by peculiar fictional beasts trying to flog something to their parents in TV commercials. That's true, why do we have this so much? The Sugar Puffs Honey Monster, Tony the Tiger from Frosties, the Hairy Dangly Mutants from Monster Munch, and the Andrex Puppy. Monster Munch is a crisp, uh, or a, what do Americans call that? Crisps, what are crisps? Fries? No. The f are crisps in America? I always get confused because there's chips, 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 uh, chips, potato chips. And there's these monster munch things. These were so popular when I was a kid and they're fucking disgusting. Like they taste way too sour. It's not good. And everyone was like, oh, you don't like monster munch? <laughs> and I was like, no, it's fucking rough. But none were quite so disconcerting to the public view, uh, to the viewing public as the terrifying sponge monkeys from Quiznos sub sandwich restaurants. I'm not very familiar with American franchise fast food restaurant based in Denver, Colorado, as we don't get them over here in the UK. Yeah, I've got, I've heard of Quiznos, but I don't know really what it is. I didn't know, I, if anyone asked me, I guess it was a Mexican restaurant because it sounds like a quesadilla or it's, you know, Q-Quidzilla. How do you spell case? I don't know. Originally founded in 1981, the company was doing brisk business in the 1990s and become one of the biggest submarine sandwich shops in North America, second only to Subway 
in fact. Oh, well, I mean, Subway's advertising fair, are we ever gonna get to that? Because it turns out their mascot was a bit of a pedo. <laughs> but sales were slipping on these toasted submarine sarnies by 2004, and so Quiznos on, because everyone was like, I'm going to the pedophile restaurant, allegedly. And so Quiznos unveiled their latest TV marketing weapon to entice the kids back into their restaurant, the Sponge Monkeys. It's quite hard to describe what they were meant to be. They were kind of like shrieking deformed gerbils with massive staring eyeball eyes housing the tiniest of pupils and sinister gummy human mouths with crooked bad teeth. But da, da 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 there's one, the ugly fuck. I feel like, Danny, it would have really helped out if you'd included a picture of this in the script. One, because you know I love wasting, you know, paper, because I hate the environment, as we've discussed. I want to poison the dolphins. And also, it would be, you know, good video content, because now I just have to imagine it. I mean, I could look it up on my iPad, but I'm not going to. Two of the levitating creatures, oh great, they fly as well, perfect, that's not scary, uh, appeared in a short series of commercials. One of them was playing guitar, while the other rasped out a simple song, We Love the Subs, in hauntingly hoarse and off-key vocals. It was quite catchy in a way. He sang, We Love the Subs! Because they're good to us. The Quizno subs. They are tasty, they are crunchy, they are warm because they toast them. Yeah, whoever write that's a fucking genius. Tell you what, my kid is uh, almost one years old and they're watching a TV show. Generally when they eat, they can't eat unless there's something to distract them. So we play them a TV show called Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. And it's like, whoever writes that, whoever writes the songs in that has never heard of rhyming. It'll be like, and now we play together. And that's the song. That's the song. I'm like, what the f is going on? Why is this so shit? What I wanted to say is the theme song for it is extremely catchy and I listen to it in the morning and then I have it in my head all day. It's Daniel Tiger's name. Uh, they, mo they most memorably- <laughs> The most memorably chilling line comes right at the end when he suddenly randomly screeches. What the f is that? I'm hoping that Sam might be able to show us some marketing magic during the course of this section. Oh yeah, Sam, play us some videos. I'm not gonna watch them now because I got shit to do. Like, I can't be just watching random videos and making good content. Sam, play some, play, look, let's just move on. Okay! I admit that I find it strangely mesmerizing and compelling. During my dog walk this afternoon, I even found myself howling. They've got a pepper bar at a complete stranger as they scurried away from me in panic. I don't know how you got outside, Danny, to be honest. I'm gonna check on you later. <laughs> And why do you have a dog in the basement? <laughs> Weird. And there now appears to be a nostalgic wave of appreciation for these cultish creatures. But not everyone appreciated them at the time, and the reports of children running away from the TV screens in sheer terror. Better sue those fuckers. Not really, don't do that. When the commercials came on the telly, even adults found them a bit disturbing. The sponge monkeys were often described as mutated rats with birth defects, hell lemurs, and drug-addled Mr. Potato Heads. Jesus Christ. Designs by the British web animator, Joel V... 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 The V E V V E K V E K V E K Um, a member of B three ta. So I guess that's Beta with a reverse three. Very clever. Uh, owner of the rather good website. I can see why the creatures appealed to a certain alternative demographic, but they were a terrible choice for mainstream TV campaign. Who the f did they appeal to? They sound horrible. It's like they, they, they were meant to appeal to f***ing blind people. And many viewers at the time felt that the diseased rodents didn't exactly promote a reassuring healthy image and hygienic environments in which to prepare sandwiches. Although everyone, no one expects that. Although everyone seems to be talking about the sponge monkeys for a while, the ants were pulled after just a few months. And they didn't appear to do much in the way of boosting the fortunes of Quiznos. Although the company once boasted over 5,000 restaurants across North America, that number has gradually been shrinking for over the years and has dropped to a new low of 800. The, but be sure to check out one if you ever got a chance because they've got a pepper bar. Maybe they should get that Jared guy to, uh, you know, he's probably looking for work. A cover, he's probably not because he's in f***ing prison. <laughs> Ah, uh, do people still get attracted to coupons? I can remember my grandma's choice of tea bags would largely be based on which brand had a coupon on the side of the packet, which she could cut out with scissors and then get about seven pence off the next box. Danny, your grandmother and my grandmother sound pretty similar. Are you from the, you're from the North, right? My grandmother was from the North. She was from Yorkshire. They're famously stingy. So uh, that would, yeah, no, this is legit. So she would have been thrilled by a particularly generous coupon offer for the Lipton Tea Company, which ran during the 1990s. You didn't just get a small discount on your next packet. You got the whole of your next box for free! Oh my god, it's almost like buy one, get one free. What a marketing innovation. <laughs> Heavily promoted on TV commercials, this offer to be proved to be enormously popular with British tea lovers as boxes of Lipton began flying off the shelves. 
But considering that Libsyn had been in business since 1871, you would have thought that somebody in marketing may have been a bit quicker in flagging up the minor flaw with a prolonged duration of the campaign. Every time a customer used the coupon, they received another free box of tea with another coupon on the site. Oh no, you can't do that. You've got to give them a different box. Everyone has free tea for life. You really? Really, guys? So all you had to do was buy one box of tea to put yourself in an uh, endless loop in which you could receive infinite Lipton tea for the rest of eternity. Quite incredibly, it took several weeks for Lipton to notice that they appeared to have accidentally adopted a new business model of producing completely free tea for the nation. The, no, if this was on Twitter, they'd know within about 30 minutes of it coming out because someone would be like, anyone see the problem with this and ruin it for everyone. Whereas back in the day, these things could go on for a while. I, I think I've told this story here before, but when I used to work in a supermarket, they'd have these promotions and sometimes the tills would f up. So I'd be working there and I'd be working on the till. I'd see something scan through and I'd be like, that's not right. And so at the end of the day, I'd just go absolutely take advantage of it. And so I remember once I came home with like 20 f***ing quiches or something and a bunch of extra f from the store because whenever the quiche was scanning through, it was turning the till into a negative balance instead of a positive balance. So I was like, okay. So I bought like 20 quiches, had like 20 pounds of credit or something, bought a CD, some other shit, and paid them about 20p. And then I walked home and gave my mom like 20 quiches. And also, I mean, if it was a small store, I'd get in trouble. But because it was like a, a giant supermarket, the, the manager's just like, yeah, we don't care. We'll just, you know, whatever, carry on. <laughs> it's like, I'm sure the big boss man would have, uh, would have not been pleased, but yeah, I don't think he, you know, he doesn't notice it, the little people. <laughs> The offer was quickly pulled from the pots when they realized that the profits appeared to have completely shriveled up. But a bum bum Teapot. Ah, ah, ah. Simon, you missed the puns. It's like, not today, friends. Another big coupon cock up was hatched by the US electronics retailer Best Buy in 2012. Again, they came up with what appeared to be a very generous offer. Customers could claim a coupon which provided a $50 discount off every purchase of $100 or more, just so long as you paid with MasterCard. Okay, so yeah, you can just buy something for 100 and get get it for 50? Well, not quite, okay, I'm st I I'm not, other than like the obvious thing that that's a big discount. Okay, what's the trick here? Do you buy, oh, I know what's gonna go on. Best Buy are definitely gonna sell Best Buy coupons. Uh, I know it. I have a feeling I know what's gonna go on. Best Buy, maybe, maybe. Best Buy are gonna sell, you know, gift cards, credit cards, you know, the, the things that you swipe through. Some of those are MasterCard. So people are gonna be buying prepaid MasterCards with a MasterCard and then using that MasterCard to buy more. Maybe, let's see. Best Buy aren't complete morons. Most of the high-end products such as say iPods, or Apple TVs, were explicitly excluded from the offer. But that's okay because I mean, if you're buying an Apple TV, I don't know how much that costs, but let's say it's $400. You're only getting 50 bucks off because it's $100 or more. So what you really, the sweet spot is the products that are $100. The deal was mainly intended to entice you into filling up your shopping cart with more of the cheap and cheerful stuff so you could hit the $100 target to claim your $50 discount. But Best Buy forgot to add one critical exclusion to the terms and conditions, gift cards, in big brain. Um, another minor oversight with the campaign was that the store forgot to put limits on how many items, how many times you could claim the offer. So for one day only, shrewd customers were snapping up huge numbers of $100 gift cards for $50 and then using them to buy as many iPods and Apple TVs as they damn well liked. Some of the biggest vendors took to social media to share photographs of the $3,000 electronics bundles they'd managed to snap up for just one and a half grand. If they were selling uh, prepaid MasterCards, this would be the golden thing. You buy a $100 prepaid MasterCard for $50. So then you've got the $100 prepaid MasterCard. And then you use $50 of that to buy another $100 thing. And then you get free money forever. So they better not be selling those MasterCard gift cards that you can get. Because uh, that would be an, a, a larger error. But this is still good. When they realized what was going on, Best Buy swiftly revised the offer the next day, even though customers had originally been promised that it would run all week. This led to many unhappy scenes throughout the course of the week, as disgruntled customers were told by staff that they couldn't use their big fistfuls of coupons to save hundreds of dollars on the proper good stuff as they had originally intended. I suspect that Best Buy shifted millions of novelty USB coffee warmers that week, though. Bada -bum -bum I like it. That's pretty good. I bounce it back. What is it about mattress companies that inspires them to come up with such appallingly bad taste marketing campaigns? The number of times mattress companies have come up on this on business plays is quite remarkable. They, they seem like they, marketing is like not their forte. Or maybe it is because we talk about them a lot, but it's always real cheesy. Not so long ago, we covered the shit show that was the Miracle Mattress commercial, which commemorated the 15th anniversary of 9-11 by promoting a Twin Towers sale. Let's not revisit that. Uh, and here's another mattress-based adver advertising campaign that makes for less than comfortable viewing. Oh God. <laughs> Although to be fair, 
We're not laying the blame at the door of the Indian bedding company Curlon, who don't appear to have actually used the offending ad. The guilty party is the Indian branch of the New York Race marketing agency Ogilvy. Og, 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 Ogilvy. Ogilvy. I've actually heard of Ogilvy, but I've only ever read it because they're a huge marketing company. But I've never said it aloud, so I didn't actually know how it's pronounced. <laughs> Who were commissioned to design it? Ogilvy came up with three different print ads based on the theme of bouncing back, and the general idea sounds quite fun and harmless. The ad consists of cartoon graphics depicting one of three well-known figures who bounce back from adversity, adversity seemingly with the help of a curl-on mattress. So for example, we see a young, long-haired Steve Jobs getting kicked out of his home and gradually falling down onto a curl-on mattress at the bottom of the ad before bouncing upwards and eventually becoming the CEO of Apple. Can you use people's images like this? That doesn't sound right. Another feature is Gandhi getting booted out of a train for whites only, only to bounce back with curl-on and lead India to independence. A slightly more distasteful, isn't it? Uh, both of these ads were used in Indian media without too much controversy. But it was the third ad that caused the problem. In 2012, the 14-year-old Pakistani student Malala Yousafzai was shot in the head by a Taliban gunman. Jesus Christ, I feel like I should pronounce her name properly after that. For daring to climb aboard a school bus and seek an education. Oh, I know this story. Doesn't she survive and then win the Nobel Peace Prize? And I'm sure we know Mal Malalia Mal Fuck, Simon, get your shit together. As I'm sure we know, Malala thankfully recovered from the attack and went on to become a celebrated activist for female education. But someone at Ogilvy decided that this would be an appropriate story. Oh no. No, Ogilvy, you're supposed to be good at your job. When I imagine uh Mad Men, I imagine Ogilvy or that other big one. Um, that begin that sounds like BDSM, but isn't BDSM. BBDO, something like that. Uh, these are the companies that I imagine as like Sterling Cooper Draper Price. But they wouldn't make this kind of error. They'd just make things about cigarettes being delicious. <laughs> But someone arguably decided this would be an appropriate story to graphically convey in, an, in a campaign designed to flog a few mattresses. So we see a cartoon of Malala getting shot in the head, then watch in horror as her blood spattered body falls down the length of the ad and becomes attached to a drip, thanks to the power of a curl on mattress. Malala then bounces her way back up to accept the Nobel Peace Prize. Fucking hell. This is not. No. No! It's worth stressing again that Curlon decided not to go with this one, but it still ended up going viral. Perhaps because Ogilvy were so proud of their work that they submitted all three ads to the Kyorius Advertising and Digital Awards in the hope of picking up a gong they didn't win. Good. Definitely good. They, they should not win. <laughs> Naturally, social media went into a bit of a meltdown over the incredibly poor judgment of using shooting a teenage girl to shift some sleeping pads. A representative Malala Yousafzai, Yousafzai, Yousafzai commented that the advert was distasteful, but declined to expand on this any further. No need for expansion. You could just say it's distasteful, or you'll fucking know this. Ogilvy originally stood by the ad. Error claiming that it was intended to be a celebration of Malala's ultimately triumphant journey through life. Yeah, dude, that doesn't mean it's not distasteful. Uh, in fairness, they clearly weren't trying to make a joke about it, it's just that graphically illustrating the blood spurting out of a teenage girl's head wasn't exactly appropriate in this case. Neither is using this to sell a f***ing mattress. The agency later changed its defensive stance, claiming that it was launching a full investigation and how its standards were compromised. You stood by the ad, Ogilvy. <laughs> you said, no, we really like it, we're submitting it for awards that we didn't win and then we'll continue to stand by it. And then people are like, this is terrible. And they're like, yeah, 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 how did this happen? I don't no, Ogilvy. Uh, it's not clear if they ever sang the designer, but if they did, maybe still got a chance to bounce back with the curl on mattress and get on the cover of time. But a bump. Ah, the wonderful world of Wang. Mm. To wrap up. Oh, is this the last page? We're at the end already. I mean, we haven't gone for a while. <laughs> Welcome to the blaze. Uh, to wrap up on a lighter note, spare a thought for the Chinese American computer engineer and inventor An Wang. That is unfortunately named. The Harvard graduate might not have been blessed with the most elegant of surnames, but that didn't stop him from proudly adopting it for the first name of his powerhouse computer business, Wang Laboratories in 1959, commonly known as just Wang for short. Originally selling typesetters and calculators, the company eventually evolved into one of the biggest computer manufacturers in the world by the 1990s, 1980s, pulling in annual revenues of over $3 billion. However, after struggling to keep up with the likes of Apple and particularly IBM, Wang had fallen into decline by the early 1990s and eventually was swallowed up by Compaq. But going back to the 1970s, Ann Wang was confused when the UK subsidiaries of his company refused to display a new wave of marketing material and posters in their stores. Wang had been keen to deliver the message to potential customers that although Wang dealt in cold circuitry and computers, the company had a warm, beating heart. Wang 
were human. They cared about you and your purchases and your long-term satisfaction. They cared about you. Where is this going? We've got five lines left. But even so, British stores just weren't really taken with the new marketing slogan at all. It was Wang Cares. And there was no way in the world that they were going to display a massive bunch of Wang Cares in their shop windows. Not for all the infinite free tea at Lipton. But up a bumps. What's wrong with Wang Cares? Oh, God, I'm fucking dumb. I'm so dumb. Wang cares. Get it? If you don't get it, you're dumb too. Let's uh, wrap it up there. This has been Business Blaze. I've been your boy with the blaze. I was going to say that this is brought to you by someone. But unfortunately for me, unfortunately for you, this video isn't sponsored by ever anyone. I'm just going to go cry in silence. Because uh, I just said Wang cares a whole lot. Uh, maybe I won't even make any money on this video. I guess Danny isn't getting fed tonight. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Wang!